fellow delegates and invitees and other participants uh, it is my pleasure to announce that we are entering into the day 2 session uh, this session uh, a parallel session technical session is the 10th and uh, convened in hall b and we have uh, chair dr k s nanjun rao from indian institute of science bangalore and co chair dr sneelal kosik from gc imt kawati uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, dr k s nanjun rao who is chairing this session on this uh, occasion dr k s nanjun rao is currently the chief research scientist in the department of civil engineering industry of science bangalore he obtained his phd degree from department of civil engineering indian institute of science in 1995 he has extensive teaching research and consultancy experience in various domains of civil engineering he has published more than tech 60 technical papers in peer reviewed journals and conferences has supervised research work of 20 students at university of science leading to doctoral and master degrees he is a recipient of acce nagadi award in 2008 for best publication in civil engineering for the book titled alternate building materials and technologies uh, he has served as a member of academic council in national institute of engineering mysore he is currently the chairman of building works committee of vishweshwaraya industrial and technological museum uh, government of india and uh, tender committee of uh, jnca sr bangalore uh, this is the brief bio data sir on behalf of the organizing committee and on my behalf i will i welcome you to chair this session uh, uh, and conduct the proceedings sir thank you professor going raju and it is my pleasure to introduce our co chair for this today's session dr sneelal kosik Sneha Lal Kosik is an assistant professor in the Department of Civil Engineering at uh, Giri Raj, uh, Girjananda Chaudhary Institute of Management and Technology, Guwahati. He is a structural engineer and a PhD from IIT Guwahati. So he has research interests in earthquake resistant design, non-linear behavior, seismic retrofitting, and earthquake damage surveys. She was an active member of uh, National Information Center of Earthquake Engineering. at iit kanpur several years she has published many research papers in national and international journals and conference proceedings in different uh, sectors of the research areas so with this brief by data uh, i welcome uh, snehalal kausik to Thank you. Thank uh, you participate so in the session as a co chair uh, now i will hand over my the floor to the chair and then co chair for this session sir over to you thank you professor goind raju it's now we what i would like to do is to share my responsibilities with my colleague dr snehal kaushik she will be managing the last three papers presentations and i will be managing the initial uh, presentations and the special lecture and okay. just to for the sake of completeness i would like to welcome you all to this session a warm good morning to all of you who are in this hall uh in of this conference and in this session we have one special lecture to be delivered by professor sirish and six paper presentations and the total time allotted is 120 minutes and it is now my pleasant duty to introduce dr sirish dr sirish is currently a professor at the department of civil engineering iit hyderabad He obtained his bachelor's degree in civil engineering from JNTU Kakinada in the year 2000 and integrated PhD in the Faculty of Engineering from Indian Institute of Science Bangalore in the year 2006 before joining IIT Hyderabad in 2010 he was a post doctoral research fellow come lecturer at the University of Texas Arlington USA his research interests are in the broad areas of pavement geotechnics foundation engineering soil stabilization and numerical modeling of geosystems he is active in teaching ug and pg students at iit hyderabad professor sirish has supervised doctoral research work of five students and currently five more students are engaged in doctoral research under his guidance any updates professor sirish can give he has supervised several pg students in their project work 
Dr. Suresh has published more than 200 technical papers and reports in peer-reviewed journals, conferences at national and international level. Dr. Suresh is conferred with several awards for his contributions. To name a few, he is the recipient of the Best Teacher Award for the years 2014 and 2018 at IIT Hyderabad. He is a recipient of DST Young Scientist Award in 2012. Dr. Suresh is also a fellow and member of several professional bodies, just to name a few. He is a life fellow member of Indian Geotechnical Society and IRC, Indian Road Congress, and member of American Society of Civil Engineers. He is on the editorial board of Indian Geotechnical Journal, Proceedings of ICE Ground Improvement Journal, Journal of Materials in Civil Engineering, ASCE. With this brief introduction, I now invite Professor Sirish to deliver his special lecture titled Resilient Behavior of Stabilized Reclaimed Bases. Over to you, Professor Sirish. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nandimura. I mean, it was a very elaborate uh, introduction. I thought uh, it should be a brief one. Thank you so much uh, uh, for, uh, for this opportunity to present some work uh, like what I'm doing here at IIT Hyderabad. So uh, let me talk about uh, today's uh, presentation topic. Uh, this is re Resilient Behavior of uh, Stabilized Reclined Bases. So this is actually a project funded by DST, um, Technology System Development in 2015-16 uh, timeframe. And we have completed this project already. And uh, this is a just outline um, because of paucity of time. So I'll just run through the introduction, necessity of the work and approach and some results and design methodologies. So looking at the road network in India, we stand uh, uh, second in the world, longest road network in the world, uh, very next to United States with 5.9 million kilometers uh, and uh, this pie chart shows us uh, how uh, distribution uh, happened in India like you know national highways versus uh, state and uh, expressways versus rural and uh, other roads so uh, the point to be noted is like 95 percent of our roads are uh, other roads which can uh, uh, carry a lot of traffic and uh, more than 500 uh, commercial vehicles per day and and the national highways are almost like 1,500 to 2,000 uh, commercial vehicles per day. And uh, most of our roads are uh, flexible payments and generally the cross-section of payments are shown here. And there are two different sections that are uh, presented. Uh, it depends on the subgrade conditions. If subgrade is uh, fairly better, the thickness of the base and subbase layers uh, can be like minimized and uh, uh, for a given traffic. For the same traffic, if the subgrade is very weak, then we have to increase the layers or thickness of each layer to make sure that the stresses and strains going on to the subgrade will be minimal. Okay, so uh, now let us look at quickly what is the market size and the government initiatives in the payment uh, industry or road construction or road infrastructure in India. Almost like uh, uh, Indian government, uh, present government uh, is actually allocated about uh, 1.4 trillion US dollars uh, to be spent on payments and road construction for the fiscal year 19, uh, 2019 and 25. And uh, National Highway Authority of India has targets uh, towards 4,500 kilometers of road projects to be awarded. And uh, almost like 1,300 uh, kilometers of roads were already awarded in the first half of uh, this year. So, uh, and it is to be like uh, almost 18% of capital expenditure uh, for the year 19, uh, 2019 to 25. That means uh, almost 20% of entire budget is spent on this uh, road infrastructure. So just to name a few, like uh, 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 Honorable Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Narendra Modi has announced recently Bhardamala Pariyojana project, uh, which is almost like uh, taking 5.3 lakh crores uh, in Indian rupees to build uh, almost like 83,000 kilometers of road in the next uh, three, four years. Um, so then it's, it's fine about all the projects and uh, uh, the uh, vision plan for the next five years. But what are the challenges that we face is approximately when I calculate um, roughly, it is taking about 12,000 tons of natural aggregates to just build a two lane uh, kilometer of a national highway. So all these 80,000 kilometers that I have just talked about, um, just I'll leave the math up to you uh, to calculate how many tons of natural aggregates are required for, for this kind of construction in the next couple of years. Uh, so that's a major challenge and uh, we, we are going to uh, consume all the natural resources in building these roads. 
And if you look at uh, Northeastern states, um, the quality of rocks and quality of aggregates are very, very poor. And uh, we definitely need an alternative uh, secondary materials for that. And if you look at payment infrastructure on the other side, how the designs are going to take place, these are different payment distresses that I have noticed uh, are pointed here. Uh, if you look at the pavement thicknesses uh, of different layers here, and generally we find uh, fatigue cracking on the asphalt layer and uh, also rutting, which is like a depression in the pavement uh, surface. Uh, this is basically due to the vertical deformation or uh, uh, settlements of the subgrade. So if the subgrade is very weak, then we will see a lot of rutting along the wheel path of the, uh, on the road. And uh, fiddy cracks are because of the tensile strain that is mobilized between the um, interface of uh, asphalt layers and granular layer. So these two are major uh, uh, concerns and the payments are designed based on these uh, criteria. One is fatigue criteria and the other one is uh, rutting criteria. Otherwise, also we see a lot of other uh, problems like roughness, reflective cracking and potholes. I'm not getting uh, into these details, but uh, the payments are designed generally for the first two. And if you look at the alternate materials uh, to be used uh, to meet the requirements of nation today, uh, several potential alternative materials can be used. And those could uh, include, but not limited to building and construction waste, uh, crumb rubber, uh, fine glass aggregates, crushed bricks, and uh, con uh, recycled concrete, and uh, recycled asphalt payments. So recycled asphalt payment is, uh, is the topic for uh, today's presentation. And uh, uh, we, in short, we call it as RAP, Reclaimed Asphalt Payment. So Reclaimed Asphalt Payment is nothing but reclaiming the asphalt uh, material or uh, aggregate material from the payment uh, during its uh, uh, reconstruction or um, resurfacing or any uh, highway expansion project. So generally, these RAP material contain uh, uh, aggregates and coated with uh, asphalt on the surface. And uh, if I extract all these asphalt out or bitumen out of this material, and we can, we can see beautifully the good quality aggregates and uh, good amount of uh, filler material, which is necessary for the road construction, which are uh, hidden in, this, um, in these particles. So these construction materials, if not properly used, we are actually throwing them in the uh, landfills. So what we uh, studied in this project is uh, to how to use this material back into the payment construction. And uh, uh, it is not that easy to directly adopt these material, even though they are, they are having a lot of good construction materials here, but because of the asphalt coating. So the behavior of the material or particles will be different if the coating is available on the surface. So uh, the production, if you look at the uh, production of wrap across the world, production is actually done based on three different methods, cold recycling, hot recycling, and uh, full depth reclamation. I'm not getting into details, but in cold recycling, this is a picture taken very close to the IIT Hyderabad campus uh, on National Highway 65, where uh, these kind of uh, cold recycling millers or region kind of uh, equipment will be used to mill the top surface. And sometimes uh, the top surface will be milled and actually th thrown uh, very next to the road. Or otherwise, sometimes we can carry and um, stockpile them as, as we see here. Okay, it is not at hillock, but it is like a stockpile, a stockpile of uh, wrap material. So this wrap material, once it is stocked, then we can definitely use back into the payments. But there are different challenges that we'll talk about. So this is the amount of wrap or uh, fly ash that I'll talk about in a minute, uh, produced across the world. So if you look at the United States, they are about uh, 110, these numbers are slightly older, two years older, but they would have reached 120 uh, million tons per annum. That's the production rate of uh, wrap material across uh, uh, in, in US. But we are, India is about uh, 4 million tons. When we started this kind of project in 2010, India was at uh, uh, very minimal. I mean, it's not in the graph uh, to speak about. So, uh, but as I mentioned earlier, India has a largest road network that very next to United States. That means the milling operations also would be, uh, should be somehow, should have been somewhere here, right? Uh, in between uh, uh, US and UK, but our milling operations are not that uh, prominent or not encouraged yet. So we need to encourage that portion and then uh, we can definitely make use of the material back into the construction. 
So this is another uh, uh, production of uh, fly ash material across India. And uh, this is from 1990 to 2030 projections. So we see that uh, uh, almost like 2000 to 3000 metric million, million uh, metric tons of uh, fly ash is produced in India. And the usage is slightly increased now. Um, it's slightly older numbers. But majority of the fly ash is actually dumped uh, uh, in, uh, in stockpiles and uh, lagoons. And uh, this is again environmental concern because of the uh, air pollution and water pollution that is expected from these, uh, um, uh, I mean, uh, bottom ash and pond ash, ash ponds. Okay. So how to use these two material together to make a green product is our challenge. So with that uh, little background, uh, these are the uh, summary of objectives that I have uh, created. So uh, the main objective is to prepare a design mix for uh, reclaimed uh, fly ash stabilized reclaimed bases. We in short, we call it as FRB mixes, and then to evaluate the resilient behavior of these materials, and then uh, go with the design methodology. So uh, to design them, basically, IRC Indian Roads Indian Roads Congress has given a uh, specific guideline in 2018, IRC 37, uh, for a cement treated basis. Okay, it is not for fly ash treated basis, but there is a mention about cement treated uh, uh, natural aggregates. So, similar uh, data can be considered or conditions can be considered to design these mixes with fly ash and RAM. So, uh, uh, the, the uh, code requirement recommends that uh, when CTBs are used in payments, it has to have uh, unconfined compressive strength of 4.5 megapascal and resilient mod modulus of about uh, 450 megapascal. This is our interest because may majority of these payment designs are based on the resilient modulus values and that's the topic for today's discussion. And apart from these, um, durability studies have to be conducted and uh, the weight loss after 14, so 12 wet dry cycles should be less than 14%. If the material uh, weight loss is more than 14%, that means the, the cement treatment or any stabilized material is not meeting the requirement. So they will not be uh, considered for payment construction because they can uh, deteriorate before the end of the design life. So uh, these are uh, fatigue and rutting uh, limiting strain equations where resilient modulus of the particular uh, sub subgrade la layer is considered. And here is the uh, 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 tensile strain and this is vertical strain and NFR uh, limiting uh, life cycles or uh, uh, service life of the payment. So this is the methodology that we have adopted. Um, basically, we have collected material and then preliminary design was conducted. Performance checks was done. Then once the material is behaving perfectly fine for the um, uh, limitations that we have, design approach was uh, pro uh, proposed and field study was also conducted. So these are material properties uh, because of shortage of time and running through these. Uh, and uh, uh, X-ray fluorescence uh, data was collected. I mean, uh, tests were conducted on different fly ashes. We, we have almost four uh, fly ashes tested, uh, including one from Queensland, which is in uh, Australia, and three from uh, uh, Andhra and Telangana states of uh, India. And uh, except Naivali fly ash, most of these fly ashes are uh, class F fly ash. Naivali fly ash with uh, higher ca calcium oxide content is class C fly ash. So each fly ash uh, with different combinations of silica aluminiferous oxide will behave differently. And we need to find what is the optimum combination for a road mixture. So in this case, uh, what we have considered is 60% wrap material was added to 40% natural aggregates or virgin aggregates. And fly ash was added as a binder and a stabilizer, about 20%. And uh, to activate fly ash, because they are all uh, classified as class C fly ashes, um, so liquid alkali activator, which is nothing but alkaline solution, is required to uh, energize or activate these uh, inert um, silica and alumina from the fly ash. So sodium hydroxide and so sodium silicate was added in a combination of different combinations. We'll be talking about 50-50% and 70-30% uh, here. So these are com ca compaction characteristics to prepare the specimens for resilient modulus and uh, UCS testing. Um, so let us look at uh, what is resilient modulus uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of these resilient uh, RAP mixes. So to, just to give you an idea, what is the concept of resilient modulus? For example, if this is a payment structure and this is the base of base layers and subgrade here. So because we are talking about resilient modulus of uh, base of base layers, which is going to be like a stabilized RAP material. So for example, if you consider a small elemental area or volume here, 
and vehicle is somewhere very far from the structure i mean point of observation so this is the point of reference for us and uh, uh, with the vehicle um, uh, very far from the point of observation then the stress conditions are very nominal and uh, this is because of the dead weight or uh, surcharge uh, or even overburden pressure on that point particular point of observation so then when there will be a vertical and horizontal stress um and this is the pressure distribution diagram i have just considered as a 2 is to 1 uh, pressure distribution here when the vehicle approaches this point of reference then what happens there is a still a pressure distribution which will not be directly influencing it but there is a small vertical deformation or uh, sorry vertical uh, stress that they can increase and when the vehicle is exactly on the point of reference then there will be a, a huge amount of vertical pressure and there will be a, a the the stress ratio or stress concentration in, on this element will be much higher and when you consider uh, just about uh, uh, the point of approach uh, i mean when the vehicle approaches the point of observation then there is another uh, stress condition that we can consider so always you can take a um, uh, coefficient of pressure at rest um to consider what is a, a confining pressure which is available so when when vehicle is traveling or uh, uh, traffic is allowed on the pavement surface then the uh, soil i mean the uh, the layers will actually uh, subjected to various uh, vertical and uh, i mean which will be like uh, deviatic stresses and confining stresses so based on these combinations and there is this is not only one tire here the wheel that we are talking about there are different classes of uh, class of vehicles that we have uh, including from cycle to uh, 18 wheel truck uh, trailer right so the weight and uh, loads coming on to this point of observation here would be entirely different when there is a different combination of vehicles that are passing on this pavement so each combination will have each uh, certain weight uh, weight um, and uh, stress constant i mean stress conditions on this element so based on that uh, uh, five combinations of confining stresses and three combinations of deviatic stresses are considered on the element and uh, that that gives us 15 combinations okay. and each combination of the stress like yes, uh, one confining okay. pressure one deviatic stress will be applied for 100 cycles and uh, the series will continue and this is a small uh, uh, animation this is actually done as per astro design guideline and um, if you look at uh, the uh, specimen here and the strain that is accumulated here can be seen uh, in this picture and um, if you look at the uh, uh, characteristic curves that we can plot this is a re uh, resilient strain and this is accumulated plastic strain plastic strain is nothing but rutting on the pavement surface and uh, now resilient modulus is defined based on the sigma d and uh, sigma d is nothing but cyclic deviatic stress uh, yeah, which is a cyclic the loading applied on the pavement surface and recoverable strain which is uh, obtained from each cycle so a resilient modulus is actually uh, measured for the last nine uh, five cycles that is out of 100 cycles and uh, an average value is reported as a resilient modulus so a sophisticated uh, cyclic triaxial or repeated load triaxial apparatus can be used here this is a tight hat the bath to conduct resilient modulus testing and this is a sample preparation for that and now you can see the effect of cyclic uh, deviatic stress on resilient modulus for different combinations of conf confining pressures for different fly ashes which are uh, uh, stabilized uh, for 28 days and you can see that with increase in confining pressure and deviatic stress the resilient modulus increases because the recoverable strain uh, i mean total strain that we have seen in the previous uh, figure uh, sorry here can be reduced uh, with increase in the confining stress and deviatic stress so that's why the uh, elastic strain also will come down that's why the resilient modulus is increasing yes. because the denominator is reducing okay so this is average uh, resilient modulus for a short and long term and these are base and sub base layers um now we can see that uh, okay, okay okay sorry sorry Yeah. yeah this is the baseline uh, as per irc and we are looking at almost uh, 1200 uh, uh, megapascals but the requirement is only for yeah, yeah, yeah. megapascals please sir it will be my uh, yeah so here unconfined compressor strength tests were also conducted in similar lines mm -hmm. and we have tested up to uh, 28 270 days uh, strength so that we can see that um, how the strength is developing so you can see that unconfined compressor strength is like a characteristic compressor strength of concrete and it is about 18 uh, megapascal so it is nothing but i would say that we are preparing like a concrete uh, 
lay a lean concrete with M18 or M10 or M15 here, uh, with the least value that we have considered, then uh, it is the strength of the concrete that we are producing out of uh, recycled uh, or reclaimed asphalt pavement and fly ash itself. So uh, this is one uh, important uh, uh, graph that shows how uh, the strength is developing with, uh, with respect to the ultimate value. Ultimate value here is considered as 270 days, but uh, seven days and uh, 28 days are having about 12% uh, uh, strength at uh, seven days. And it is achieving, uh, the, the concrete is achieving about uh, uh, 40, um, uh, sorry, 40 percent at 28 days. That means uh, we can, this information is very useful for the field engineers because uh, right after construction, what is the strength they are expecting and based on that, uh, they, will, uh, they will go for the next layer construction or even moving the uh, uh, construction equipment on, the, on these layers. So up to seven days is actually a, a minimum period that we don't want to disturb the layer so that it will achieve uh, at least uh, uh, 10 to 15 percent of the strength, ultimate strength. So at 28 days, obviously 40 percent strength is attained. It is very different from uh, uh, regular concrete or Portland cement concrete because uh, at 90 percent, 90 percent of the strength is uh, expected at 28 days. But here it's only 28 percent. So with these uh, important data, I'm not showing other uh, extensive studies that we have conducted, uh, just to give a brief uh, idea about how the payment design can be um, uh, taken up with these recycled materials. So this is actually a framework that we have created, which is called a uh, uh, semi-mechanistic uh, approach, because if you look at ASTO's design guideline, it is a uh, uh, mechanistic empirical, because empirical uh, equations are also generally used in these payment designs. So we wanted to reduce that by taking uh, more of uh, mechanistic parameters, which is like uh, resilient modulus, shear strength, and uh, other properties, uh, and also considering the climatic conditions like durability and uh, uh, leaching effects and other uh, environmental factors uh, to design, uh, to propose the design here. So this is a typical cross-section uh, of the material, uh, of the uh, new construction process that we have uh, uh, introduced. So here a drainage layer is expect, I mean, provided above the uh, moderately stabilized wrap basis because drainage will not be uh, very high uh, when the material is uh, stabilized with uh, any stabilizer, right? So these are different uh, uh, variables that we have used. I'm not going into detail here, but this is a graph that shows uh, how base layer resilient modulus of the wrap uh, material uh, with uh, layer coefficients here and uh, we, we did not propose uh, one single uh, unique curve here because the payment design or payment thickness of each layer uh, will depends uh, will completely depend on the CBR value. If the subgrade is very poor uh, we cannot have uh, one size fit for all, all kind of uh, design here. That is the uh, case earlier. I mean, when you talk about uh, ASTO design methodology, it is only one single equation that gives uh, the payment construction, I mean, uh, designs for, um, uh, I mean, single design, single equation was uh, proposed earlier. So here we have proposed three different equations to cater for with high uh, coefficient of determination. And with this uh, design, uh, new mid design methodology, we developed design charts based on resilient modulus of the uh, base of base layers and uh, thickness of these layers can be directly read from this uh, particular graph for different uh, severe conditions. So uh, we uh, have taken this data uh, and with the confidence we went, uh, went and constructed the uh, field sections. Um, this is the uh, original design conducted, uh, uh, I mean, uh, developed by uh, Andhra Pradesh uh, Road Development Corporation. And uh, uh, the traffic was about uh, 20.3 million standard axles, cyclic loading, and uh, the thickness was about uh, 530 millimeters. So we have redesigned the same section using our uh, present uh, design and methodology. And we can actually provide the Insta 550, the base layer itself, uh, we reduce from 250 to 175 millimeters, a reduction of 20% uh, material uh, can be reduced from, from this approach. So these are some construction pictures that, uh, uh, that we have adopted. This is a road uh, with base layer, and this is a curing for seven, seven days and rolling was done. And uh, some instrumentation like in kilometers and pressure sensors were adopted. And, uh, and after construction of all the other layers, including the surface layer, uh, in kilometers were monitored with traffic. This is a, obviously we have asked them to stop here 
but generally this uh, data is collected uh, throughout this length of the road uh, when the traffic is moving and uh, we will know like what are the different uh, vertical deformations and settlements across the pavement layers and uh, this is our horizontal and kilometer data from control section and we monitored for almost three and a half years and this is the control section and if you look at uh, the uh, vertical axis they are about uh, 10 millimeters here okay and uh, the data is uh, and the deformations are about uh, two millimeters plus or minus here it is four millimeters in the control section so what we can conclude from here is that um, the uh, recycled uh, uh, base material is performing either uh, better or equal to the conventional design with a reduction of about 20 percent of thickness so that's the uh, key factor or uh, key uh, finding from this study and this is the road uh, uh, condition of the road after three and a half years of monitoring and this is a stretch of 250, 250 meters that we have laid uh, uh, using that and this part is a conventional road the other side of the road is uh, made from uh, the recycle i mean frb road so with that i would like to conclude that a high volume of wrap about uh, 60 to 70 percent of wrap can be used that means 70 percent of virgin aggregates can be reduced here and fly ash is another uh, good stabilizer which can help us as a um, filler come stabilizer but a proper uh, treatment or alkali activator is required and uh, resilient modulus of wrap material can be improved uh, with fly ash stabilization and the uh, MR values or resilient modulus values of stabilized wrap is found about uh, 1400 to 1600 megapascal but the requirement for as per uh, IRC is about only 450 megapascal. So a me semi-mechanistic design approach was proposed in this uh, uh, study based on resilient modulus and 25% uh, of re uh, reduction in payment base material and 20% reduction cost was achieved at the end of the construction and uh, uh, three, year of, three years of uh, design life. So hence wrap is a sustainable material which can be adopted for payment construction. And uh, coming to the acknowledgements, I would like to acknowledge uh, my PhD and uh, master's students at IIT Hyderabad, especially Deepthi and Mahesh who extensively worked on this project and uh, Mr. Sharath, who, is, uh, who was a master's student. And uh, I'd like to thank the uh, Department of Science and Technology for funding this project and uh, APRDC for letting us uh, construct the road in the, uh, on a state highway. And also like to thank all the organizers uh, for providing me this opportunity to present my work here. And uh, this is my, short, I mean, uh, my group at IIT Hyderabad. And thank you very much for your attention and uh, patient here. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to address. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Sirish, for a very nice presentation. Uh, thank you. I just would like to see, uh, Govind Raju, are there any, uh, anything posted on Q &A, in the Q&A box? I don't see anything here. No, no, sir. No. Yeah. Uh, uh, again, uh, uh, Professor Sirish, uh, thank you very much for a very nice presentation. However, I would like to just uh, uh, make some comments and uh, seek sure. some clarifications from you. So, you said that you are using flash and uh, the alkali as an activator. Actual activator. So, see, this is similar to our uh, geopolymer kind of thing. This is geopolymer. Yes. Actually, activated kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a geopolymer. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the sodium hydroxide solution, what you're using, what is the molarity of the solution? Yeah, we that? have used uh, different molarities because we have used uh, four different combinations, um, fly ashes. So it varied anywhere between uh, 0.5 molar to 3 molar. Highest is 3 molar for Vijayawada fly ash. And um, when compared to concrete, uh, it is very less. In concrete, generally you use 6 to 8 percent of molarity, 8, eight molarity. Yeah. But this is very molar normally we use. Is there any reason for using such a lower molarity in road uh, Because uh, the target values are very limited. For, I mean, target values are UCS and resilient modulus. And we don't want to dump chemicals into the road and uh, spoil the environment also. So uh, we have uh, initially tested uh, all the combinations, like different combinations with up to uh, 0.5 molar to 10 molar. And we, we have seen like uh, basically what we need is alkali 
uh, environment, which is something like pH of uh, 12.3. Uh, so that's good enough for us to uh, activate the flash, like silica and alumina, which, has, which are in uh, inert state. So that's why we, we were uh, uh, good with this. And uh, we have tried uh, resilient modulus and shear, I mean, shear strength as well. And those limits are much, be- much beyond what we uh, actually require. So we are looking at only 4.5 megapascal and uh, 450 megapascal. So those are uh, very well satisfied with these combinations. So that's why we reduce the uh, usage of like uh, alkali activator in this. Yeah, but right. the sodium silicate, is it uh, necessary here? If the fly ash is quite good, then... Ah, you- because uh, fly ash is all, I mean, um, except Naiveli, in India, most of the fly ashes are class F. Class of fly ash, which uh, which has very low silica content. I mean, sorry, uh, calcium oxide content about one to two percent, and so they cannot directly participate in uh, CSH or CA, CAH uh, gels. So what we have uh, looked at is uh, NASH gels like sodium uh, calcium uh, aluminate silicates. So for that, uh, uh, yeah, for that combination, uh, we have used. Uh, um, because these are uh, like low calcium fly ashes, we have to reset on that uh, geopolymer combination. Did you so, try anything with the hybrid like GGBS? Uh, it- yeah, that's uh, another combination. Uh, fly ash and GGBS can be used uh, because their silica and alumina are very a- highly active, reactive. Yeah. So what has happened in this uh, case, this uh, low calcium fly ash that we have used, the silica content uh, which is available is, is not in amorphous state. Most of it is like uh, crystalline, so yeah. very limited uh, amount of silica was was ready to react. So we need to supplement uh, um, silicates using, I mean, water glass or like sodium silicate. So that was the reason why we have to add uh, combination. And if you look at Naiveli, which uh, uh, the combination of silica silicates and aluminate, sorry, uh, sodium silicate and sodium hydroxide, uh, the ratio is entirely different. So somewhere uh, it can be like one is to one, sometimes it is 1.5 is to one, something like that. So uh, we need to justify or like, no, uh, a priori, like we need to test it and see which combination is uh, providing more, uh, I mean, releasing more reactive silica. And then if more reactive silica is available, then we can reduce silicates in that supplement of silicates. Yeah. That way we have uh, studied. Yeah, it's a very good uh, work. I would say very appropriate and timely with the initiative of the government in trying to expand our roads. Correct, correct. Uh, the, and also, it's a very good thing that you are suggesting some things where you have can use alternative materials rather than explore our natural materials, which is already so scarce. And we are making our uh, uh, countryside look bald and things like that. Anyway, <laughs> we, I and you can't avoid getting bald, but at least our correct. natural things has to be taken care of. Uh, so it's a very nice thing. And if anybody uh, else has any uh, comments, I would. I, have, uh, I want one uh, clarification from uh, Professor Sirish. Please Professor please. Sirish, it is a very interesting and highly informative lecture. Thank I you. enjoyed a lot. But uh, all said and done, you have a, a very good, very good control in the laboratory for the mixed design and uh, achieving uh, the target strength and all. But when it comes to the field study implementation level, how do you control all these mixes in certain yeah, that's a very good, promotions? Very good question. Actually, out of this project, after three years, we have already uh, constructed the test section, and we ha- the experience is entirely different. It's like a flip side of the coin. Like no, in the lab, you have all everything is under control, but in the field, uh, absolutely right. I mean, I'm with you. So there, uh, to do that, actually, we need we need a lot of uh, pre preparation for the for the entire construction. So that took us like almost three three four days, and uh, this sodium silicate and sodium hydroxide combination is also exothermic, and we need to just uh, cannot dump the material there. So some pictures I've shown, but I could not get into the details because of uh, time. So actually, we need to prepare the mixture uh, a day before. At least this combination, like uh, sodium silicate and sodium hydroxide combination, we need to prepare them. And uh, but should not mix it with the fly ash and other aggregates. That that goes next day. And we need to do this thing. Uh, we ask like that means like a late evening, late night, where temperatures are low because uh, it will produce a lot of uh, uh, temperature exothermic reactions, right? 
So because it is only 250 meter stretch, we could uh, manually do it. But what I've recommended to DST or even uh, to the government is uh, that we can actually take uh, batching plants for that. Uh, for example, if it is like for a couple of kilometers, we can adopt uh, batching plants and that their control can be like uh, much better. So true. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And I yeah, really enjoyed the lecture. Sir, sir, I have a query uh, Please, yeah. Yeah. regarding this. Uh, can we apply this thing on this uh, bridge deck also? Like uh, there also we are roads are means getting damaged because daily we need to repair and also. Huh. Like, uh, because can, uh, yeah. Or Someone... you can suggest something. You can suggest something for that type of construction also over the bridge. Yeah, I bridge think uh, Professor Ranjendra is right person to answer that. <laughs> but anyway, let me try. <laughs> Uh, because it is uh, it is not fully concrete. Uh, or for example, if I look at yes, the bridge yes. deck, uh, just to avoid two things: one is noise as well as damage to the bridge deck. Generally, asphalt layers are placed instead of uh, like again concrete layer on top of uh, bridge deck. So, in that perspective, uh, I would uh, not recommend this material there because it is uh, low grade again concrete, and you need to wait for some time, and then mixing process is entirely different. And the stretch that you're looking at, maybe uh, one or two kilometers length. I mean, even if you look at large uh, major bridges, right? So there will be other challenges uh, other than just laying a road there. So in that case, uh, I think always a good grade. Uh, there are multiple uh, uh, mixed designs are available these days in terms of like uh, asphalt layers, like uh, crumb double modified or polymer modified or high grade uh, viscous grade. Uh, as for layers, those can be provided and that will also act as a cushion as well as noise barrier for, for the bridge tax. So, yeah, my call will be like that. Probably, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you so Professor Nanjandra can add. <laughs> Maybe. Too sure, you will not save significantly materials in bridges. This is where <laughs> the saving is more important and uh, that is the primary objective. Yeah. Correct. Correct. So, if there are no more and I think we have, we will move to the next uh, uh, presentations, paper presentations, and thank, let us thank Sirish, even though we are at a distance. Thank you, Professor Suresh. Thank you. Thank you. Now, before starting the paper presentation, I wish to announce the information from the conference organizers that they would like to encourage student presenters and would like to reward them with best presentation award. So therefore, I request the speakers to identify themselves if they are students, so that it will enable us to make the recommendations to the conference organizers. And now I open the session for paper presentations. I call upon uh, Ms. Uh, Sagar Barua to make the presentation on the topic, uh, seismic response perspective for proposed subway tunnel near Kamalapura railway station. Mr. Sagar Barua from Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology, Bangladesh. Yes, sir. Please identify if you are a student. Thank you, sir. Are you a student, President? Sir, I am a BSc student of, yes, sir. I am a BSc student from Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology. Okay. Good evening, um, and uh, good afternoon and greetings, everyone. I am Sagar Barua. Today, I'm, I would like to present our research, our research about seismic response perspective for proposed subway tunnel near Kamlapur railway station. This is a part of our undergraduate research study, which is uh, uh, supervised by Dr. Tahamid Malik Al Husseini. First, let me talk about the research objective of this paper. The purpose of this paper is to assess the seismic response of the proposed soil tunnel system at a specific location in Dhaka soil by generating a soil tunnel system using 2D final element modeling. For this analysis, three different intensity levels of earthquake has been considered. They are the Imperial Valley, the Po Bay, and the North Ridge. Now, let me talk about the study area chosen for this paper. The map shown here is the layout of proposed Dhaka mass road transit. The blue lines are the underground, underground portion, whereas the green are the elevated one. The paper considers a site near Kamlapur railway station, the railway hub in Dhaka city, where MRT line one will end. The corresponding borehole location and borehole data is also presented in this slide. 
This figure presents a schematic view of soil tunnel system considered for numerical analysis. A seven meter diameter tunnel with a reinforced concrete tunnel lining thickness with 0.3 meter is assumed to have eight meter of overburdened soil. A schematic view of the 2D model with soil properties of different layer is shown here. The soil profile is divided into 11 layers. The corresponding shear wave velocity and densities are shown in this figure. Now, let me talk about the methodology chosen for this project. Here, the methodology part is uh, divided into two sections. The first section is using site response analysis by using deep soil. And second part is uh, performing time history analysis in Texas 2D. According to the updated version of Bangladesh National Building Board, Dhaka has a seismic zone coefficient of 0.2 G, whereas a uh, rock site of maximum considered upwell. For local site conditions consisting of allodium, site amplification is expected, which is assessed by conducting site response analysis. For this analysis, three different intensity levels are considered with PGA equal to 0.2G, 25G, 0.2G, and 0.15G, which here are represented as case one, case two, and case three, respectively. Here, this uh, all nine cases are used as an input in deep soil. As a result, nine sets of earthquake motions are considered through one-dimensional wave propagation analysis adopting an equivalent linear method. Ground motion at depth of 44 meters is obtained. This table also presents the PGA value obtained at 84 meters for nine sets of input motions. It is observed that the imperial valley and the north ridge has significantly uh, results significantly greater PGA value compared to that for the Kobe earthquake. The ground motion records for, nine, uh, for 44 meter depth are finally used as input in the base of the soil tunnel system's numerical method for further uh, numerical analysis in plexus. Here, uh, a 2D plane strain model adopting 15 nodal triangular elements is used to generate the finite element mesh for the problem shown in this figure. The model is provided with viscous boundary conditions on the vertical boundaries described as absorbing boundary, in while input motions as acceleration time history obtained from seismic site response analysis is applied at the base of the model as shown in this figure. This will generate significant amount of straining forces in the tunnel lining. We will talk about this now. The time history analysis is performed in Plexus 2D to evaluate the seismic response of the tunnel soil system. Two parameters are considered in this paper, which can affect tunnel lining design. They are induced horizontal distortion and induced movement. First, let me see about the findings of induced horizontal distortion. This figure presents horizontal distortion in the tunnel lining, which is defined as the relative lateral displacement between the tunnel top and tunnel bottom. For different intensity levels of earthquake, the relative displacement is found to be in order of millimeter. Let me re remind you about the case one, case two, and case three. They are the scale factor used in seismic sizes response analysis, which are equivalent to 0.25G, 0.2G, and 0.15G respectively. The maximum distortion is found to be around 4.5 millimeter, which corresponds to the Imperial Valley earthquake. Whereas Northridge earthquake yields the minimum distortion in the tunnel lining. In this next figure, this figure presents the maximum induced bending moment in the tunnel lining for different intensity earthquake levels. Here, the Kobe induced the maximum bending moment in the tunnel lining, which is around 88 newton meter per meter, whereas the north ridge earthquake is the minimum value in the tunnel line. So let's summarize our findings and see what we, we have found. It is found that maximum induced horizontal distortion, which is 4.5 millimeter in the tunnel lining, is caused by the imperial valley earthquake. It is worth mentioning that the north ridge earthquake has the maximum PGA value at the 44 meter depth but it still is the minimum distortion. Again, relative horizontal distortion in the tunnel lining is not proportional to the intensity level of the earthquake. 
Next, uh, we, you, uh, we have found that application of seismic motion generates significant bending moment in the tunnel lining, which is important in case of construction of tunnel. It is observed that the Kobe earthquake with the lowest PGA at the base motion is the largest bending moment. This highlights the importance of characteristics of earthquakes other than peak ground acceleration value. We are solely grateful to Web Pass for letting us to carry out our plaque history analysis in their computational laboratory. Thank you for your kind attention. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Govindraj, I don't see any questions posted in Q&A. Are there any? Anybody would like to ask any questions, clarifications and comments, please? Yes, sir. One simple clarification I require. Please. That is, uh, I just want to know the basis on which, you know, the meshing of this uh, uh, plane strain model is done. I don't find any kind of a fine meshing around the tunnel. And also we know that the results of this uh, analysis, site response analysis will be very critically affected by the element sizes. It should have some kind of a correlation with the wave length. So I would like to know from the other what any criteria they have used for the meshing in determining the number of elements or the size of the elements and why a fine meshing is missing around the tunnel. Uh, uh. Thank you for your questions. Uh, we have uh, tried different type of mesh for this uh, uh, analysis. Well, we, uh, we found that the fine mesh has uh, shows the most accurate values and most uh, uh, represents the most accurate uh, uh, site representation value. And we also use the proper damping ratios for that uh, for we found from the site response analysis and we use that in the plexus studio analysis for proper mesh uh, sizes and uh, well, uh, uh, now we're finding our results. Any further questions from or comments? If there are none, let's thank Mr. Sagar Barua for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I now proceed to the second paper presentation and I invite uh, Madam Priyadarshini and she'll be presenting the paper Deformation of Stone Column Subjected to Earthquake Loading by Numerical Analysis. Madam Priyadarshini, please. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Are you student, madam? Yes, sir. I'm a research scholar from the uh, College of Engineering, Kindi. And I know, sir. Good morning, uh, respected professors, uh, uh, experts, and my dear friends. Uh, I'm Amar Priyadarshini, a research scholar from College of Engineering, Kindi, and I know, Chennai. I'm going to present my research study, Deformation of Stone Column Subjected to Earthquake Loading by Numerical Analysis, which I have done under the guidance of Dr. K. Premalaka. Professor Anna University Chennai. The outline of my presentation is, goes like this, an introduction, literature, objective, methodology, results, and discussion and conclusion. Stone columns are being extensively used as a ground improvement technique to improve the strength of weaker soil deposits by the function of vertical drainage and reinforcement as illustrated here. Recently, encasement of a stone column is also being practiced. In this decade, with the development of new technologies that led to the study of seismic behavior of the stone column by experiments and a numerical analysis. From the literature, studies on static loading through experimental and numerical investigations reported findings of uh, stone column behavior, critical column length, depth of uh, maximum bulging, uh, spacing between stone columns, the effect of diameter on the load carrying capacity of stone column, settlement and its influence by the length of the column. Also, the stress concentration factor influenced by the L by D ratio consolidation and the rigidity of the foundation. From the available studies on earthquake loading through laboratory and numerical investigations, some of the findings are reported, uh, like uh, the reduction in the shear deformation of the improved ground, the efficiency of the end bearing stone columns when compared to the floating type, and the prevention of bulging failure during an earthquake by providing encasement and efficiency of stone columns even in the sloping ground. From the gap identified from the literature studied, the objective was coined. It was to compare the deformation pattern, load settlement curve, and stress concentration factor of the stone column when it is subjected to static and earthquake loading. This study was carried out by numerical analysis using Plaxis 2D. Plaxis 2D is a finite element software for a 2D geotechnical analysis. The genuineness of the results must be verified by validating the numerical model by simulating the field behavior. For static analysis, field data of a stone column installed ground for a secondary clarifier was simulated 
and the pressure versus settlement graph as obtained from the field was comparable with that of the plexus results for earthquake analysis settlement data recorded for a power plant before and after the earthquake was utilized for validation the field settlement data were compared with the numerical analysis result thus validating the model the methodology followed was to perform the numerical analysis by varying the diameter of the stone column and the magnitude of the earthquake as mentioned before analysis were carried out for both static and earthquake loading in the numerical analysis the loading was done in two ways in one case the stone column alone was loaded to know the effectiveness of loading and in another case the stone column along with its tributary area was loaded that is the equivalent diameter of the stone column the parameters considered for the modeling of the stone column reinforced ground are shown here the clay bed was 10 meter installed with the stone column of a different diameters of length 6 meter that is a floating type of stone column here for earthquake analysis earthquake data from nepal costa rica new guinea were utilized for 5.5 6.5 and 7.5 magnitudes respectively the load applied on the stone column was determined using the indian standard code for the stone columns is 15284 part 1 the properties of clay and stone column used for modeling are shown here for the soil and stone column the mohr coulomb model was used for the simplicity and the properties were adopted from the mentioned reference now the results obtained and the discussion about them here this slide shows the model for static loading in this model only the column alone was loaded stone columns are analyzed for loading till the verge of failure and here though the load settlement curve is non linear the linearity portion increases with an increase in the diameter of the stone column the ultimate load and load capacities for permissible settlement can be read from the graph maximum bulging is observed up to a, at a depth of 0.5d and up to a radial distance of 2d from the periphery of the stone column the total depth of bulging is around 4d stress concentration factor is computed for failure load based on the analysis results vertical effective stresses are read as an average value over the head of the stone column and clay within a 1.05 times the spacing of the stone column the capacity of the stone column increases with the diameter but there is a reduction in the scf by a percentage of 3 such a large value of scf is due to the loading of a stone column alone this is because the maximum extent of the load is taken by the stone column the equivalent diameter for the triangular pattern of the stone column is assumed here for a spacing of 2 times the diameter of the stone column the equivalent diameter is computed and utilized for the numerical analysis similar to the previous case the load settlement curve was obtained and from the figure it can be <clears throat> pointed out that bulging is a maximum value at a depth of 1.5d and bulging is observed up to a radial distance of 2.7d from the periphery of the stone column the total depth of bulging observed is 5d up to up to 5d depth in this case clay is also subjected to loading which offers less resistance to bulging this increases the bulging with an increase in the diameter of the stone column when the equivalent area is loaded up to failure both column and clay bear the load thereby reducing the stress concentration factor value which is lesser than the stone column alone loaded condition irrespective of the diameters of the stone column the scf value remains the same when the stone column alone is loaded and is subjected to an earthquake of a different magnitude there will be some change in the behavior of the stone column in terms of the settlement bulging pattern and stress concentration factor earthquake is simulated using time mystery input motion using prescribed displacement option in plexus here the settlement depends on the diameter of the stone column and the magnitude of the earthquake the decrease in settlement value for a sound point for a, say sound point by magnitude could be due to the uh, lesser peak acceleration as mentioned in the previous table from the analysis result it was observed that irrespective of the magnitude and diameter of the stone column the maximum depth of bulging is a 0.5d and the total depth of bulging is 4d as observed in static condition but for uh, the radial distance it has increased to 3d the stress concentration factor for earthquake loading is of higher order when compared to the static condition and here scf uh, depends on the diameter of the stone column and the magnitude of earthquake from the observations for a stone column diameter and uh, 
different magnitude scf values are almost the same and conclusion the maximum depth of bulging the radial distance of bulging and the total depth of bulging are shown in this table as mentioned earlier for earthquake loading when the stone column alone is loaded the stress concentration is much higher when compared to the static condition with that i like to conclude that for this study the results indicates that the higher efficiency of stone columns in mobilizing the stresses when subjected to earthquake loading and this concludes my presentation these are the references which i have used for this study thank you for listening thank you thank you madam prajeshni for your nice presentation thank you sir there is one q question somebody has posted here yeah i read out the question madam is soil yes, damping considered in the analysis this is the question is soil damping considered soil. in the analysis yes sir actually sir, sir in, uh, i i think this question is uh, for the previous presentation i suppose because that was there before the starting of uh, okay. her presentation yeah so uh, i in fact this is relevant to prayer yes, sir yes sir it's so relevant to me also you will talk about damping so you have done a dynamic analysis right yes sir i have done a dynamic analysis but in uh, as i have used a more cool model for the uh, soil uh, there is uh, no option for uh, damping in that and uh, it is when we are going for earthquake loading if the if you are not giving a damping then the inbuilt uh, option can be used for the uh, analysis so uh, deliberately i didn't give any damping for soil okay now i just have a question to you on uh, you are talking about stress concentration factor yes sir uh, so we do in structural engineering we define it in some fashion but what is stress concentration how do you define stress concentration factor here a stress concentration factor is actually the ratio of the load taken by the stone column to the uh stress sorry not the load the stress take, taken by the stone column to the stress taken by the soil the within the triangular pattern there will be a unit cell that is up to which uh, diameter the uh, stone column will have uh, its effect so within that area within the tributary area we will be calculating how much stress is taken by the stone and how much stress is taken by the soil so with that ratio we can find out the stress concentration factor so yeah, yeah. from that uh, we can find how much uh, the column is uh, effectively uh, taking the load okay the ratio of the load distribution be uh, between the stone column and column the, and the surrounding yes. the clay yes. Yes. now you also talked about uh, earthquake analysis and you yes. said uh, you use three different magnitudes of earthquakes yes sir what you know what was your base earthquake Did you use uh, any base earthquake for that? Or? Actually, uh, time this, history you said. So which was the earthquake you did? Yeah, which was the earthquake type? Which was excuse which? Which earthquake did you use as a base? As a base earthquake. As a base earthquake, actually, uh, I have simulated uh, three different earthquakes uh, for the three magnitudes, sir. Uh. So this uh, time history analysis for uh, these three different uh, earthquakes were uh, uh, simulated in the Plaxus Studi. as uh, the time history graph uh, and uh, that uh, was used for the as a base earthquake so it doesn't correspond to any real earthquake you it was a synthetic earthquake is what you are saying uh, no sir not synthetic earthquake actually i have uh, obtained this uh, uh, time history plot from uh, strong center uh, website uh, strong motion center website uh, and uh, from that i have uh, used the real time uh, that the real uh, already happened earthquake Yes, that's what i'm asking which is the earthquake you are considered um for uh, the 5.5 magnitude uh, it was a uh, nagarkot nepal uh, uh, earthquake and then 6.5 it was costa ricas and 7.5 it was a papua new guinea earthquake sir okay okay that was missing in your presentation so that's sir, the reason uh, why i asked uh, okay. i mentioned in the parameters sir okay 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 thank you Thank, Thank you so much. Sir. Any more any more questions or comments from my yeah, colleagues? Yes, uh, Priyadarshan, madam. Yes, very good presentation. Thank you, sir. So I just have some a few queries. It's a very basic queries only. Okay, sir. This is basically is a plane strain analysis. Am I right? You did a plane strain analysis in the Plaxus 2D. Yes, sir. 
so Actually, how did you it is axis symmetric condition here for the stone column so how did you uh, model the mobilized cohesion along that is uh, stone versus uh, stone soil interface uh, how did you model the cohesion actually sir i didn't uh, change the cohesion value because uh, in the using the mohr coulomb model i have uh, uh, used the cohesion but uh, i didn't change or uh, uh, do any uh, variation in the uh, cohesion value sir and one more thing i want to ask you one very simple thing you yes, have investigated sir. for earthquakes of say 5.5 6.5 and it is going up to say 7.5 yes sir so are you really confident that the soil will not be pushed into the non linear zone because we are talking about earthquakes of the magnitude 7.5 yes sir actually uh, yes sir there are, there are many chances for that just for the sake of study how effective is the stone column against the earthquake is being studied here but it is a, just a basic study and it requires a, a more complicated studies also sir and one more thing as a sir has already told whenever we take you know any records from outside whether it is a peer records or any smcg records etc it is important that you do some kind of a matching with the standard spectrum okay, okay. the spectrum that is containing you know the frequency content and all so then please convert this into compatible compatible ground motions that matches with the response spectrum of the area then only that will provide you the real frequency contents etc etc providing you the realistic results okay that's all yes sir thank you so much sir thank you for the suggestion yeah i have a comment uh, is it okay if i mean yes, yeah sir. Yes, yes, sir. yeah actually uh, uh, ms pradeshni is a nice presentation uh, i have so one, much, one or two comments uh, or clarifications to seek actually Yes, uh you have used a uh, mohr coulomb model for both soil as well as uh, um stone columns like yes, uh, as mr uh, dr uh, jayrajan and even uh, other colleagues have asked you uh, so it should not be the same case because you could have tried uh, a hardening model instead of yes, like mohr coulomb model that non linearity would have uh, been taken into account yes, that is one comment probably you can check it uh, check it back yes, the yes. other comment that i have is um, on the uh, uh, stress concentration factor so was that uh, predefined uh, in your analysis or you have calculated how much stress was sir, distributed sir i have calculated actually it is not predefined because for the applied load uh, how much uh, stress is taken by the stone column and uh, how much stress is taken by the soil is uh, calculated and then i have reported that uh, value sir okay but in reality what happens in practice uh, the n which is a stress concentration fa factor is maintained between 2.5 and 5 for stone columns yes sir but what i noticed in your analysis is like 200 150 it's very very yes, yes it's very I, high practically how because that means you are talking about like stiffness of your, your stone column versus soil is 200 times Uh, or one fifty times is very very high. Yes, sir. It's very so, high actually. Uh, hmm. But uh, this is uh, here. I have loaded the stone column alone condition. That is not uh, possible in practical cases. So just for uh, the understanding of uh, how the stone column is uh, taking the load and. Uh, but if you have loaded only stone column, how can you calculate stress on the soil? How much stress? Uh, actually, the soil can. Uh, take stress due to the bulging of the stone column mm, the, due that, to the i think it's a miscalculation of your stress i mean stress concentration factor probably please check because your loading supposed to be uh, on entire uh, unit cell because you are talking about unit cell right yes sir on a triangular cell. pattern if you take uh, effective diameter is 1.05s mm. and uh, stone column uh, diameter versus soil diameter yes, you need to you need to load the entire uh, unit cell that means including your stone column versus soil then you can uh, talk about your stress concentration factor because of stiffness difference uh, most of the stress goes to your stone column and less will be on the soil so okay. that's how you should calculate right at the interface of your loading pad pad or loading uh, zone and the uh, soil conditions because okay. this is actually uh, based on sigma 3 i think you have calculated <coughs> yes, actually uh, one more thing sir uh, for both the conditions uh, we have uh, i have calculated the stress concentration factor that is for a uh, stone column alone loaded and uh, the equivalent diameter also loaded if this is uh, for uh, the 
comparison and uh, how uh, the uh, stress is being uh, transferred for just for understanding and it is not practically possible uh, please, yes, sir, please go understand. back and check it again yeah that's yes, that's sir. my comment only yeah sure yes, thank, you. thank you sir thank you so much yeah i will move the third presentation uh, thank you, i now invite madam vasanta lakshmi she'll be speaking on seismic performance of the amruteshwar temple shake table test of the dry stone masonry structure Uh, good morning uh, everyone this is uh, vasanta lakshmi and uh, i am a research scholar uh, uh, doing my be uh, under uh, guidance of dr vijay lakshmi at the k school of engineering and management okay seismic performance of uh, Am the amruteshwara temple a shake table test of a dry stone masonry structure under the guidance of uh, dr vijay lakshmi uh, here is a need for the study and there is no life span or uh, depreciation value for an ancient monument and a greater significant part of the ancient monument stands only for their heritage value and the visual treasure of the onlookers for example the structural remains of the roman times on the capitol hill rome are considered uh, more important than a 18th century palace structure seen near the roman site over a period of time the realization of artistic or other values of a structure or structural remains becomes unique with enhanced value and becomes an ancient monument worthy of preservation preservation of monument is of uh, national importance to see that the structure or structural remains can convey its intrinsic architectural and archaeological or other values to future uh, generations without losing their originality in this context the present work is about the amruteshwara temple which was uh, built uh, under the amruteshwara dandanayaka the commander under the rule of the king balala 2 and it is uh, located uh, uh, in amrutapura which is uh, around 65 kilometers from chikmagalur district or around 250 kilometers from bangalore karnataka this temple is one of the hoysala architectural temples which was built in the year 1196 ce the hoysala uh, empire was uh, uh, predominant in south indian kannadiga uh, empire it is a south indian kannadiga empire uh, who mostly ruled in the uh, modern day state of karnataka as you can see in the figure 2 and uh, here in the figure 1 you can see the uh, uh, temple uh, which uh, uh, which i have chosen for the study that is amruteshwara temple and uh, the temple is protected by archaeological survey of india the hoysala uh, uh, empire was most more popular because of, of their temple architecture so uh, large and small temples built during this hoysala uh, period that is between 10th century to, to 14th century remained as examples of hoysala architecture style to name a few are uh, Bel- uh, uh, chanakeshwara temple at beluru and hoysalaeshwara temple at halebidu uh, there are many and to main a few uh, to name some are those two So coming to the objectives of the study to construct a scaled model of Damrateshwara temple and subject them to ground motion test using a shake table at CPRI and the experimental results were used for validating the numerical model to start with the study started and uh, later to conduct further in- investigations on the prototype with these results so what was the method uh, the methodology adopted was first technical survey was done with the plan available from the archaeological survey of india we cross check the dimensions whether uh, any changes that have occurred over a period of time then various tests were carried out to determine the material properties such as unagel compression test uh, to determine eng's modulus poisson ratio compressive strength and the brazilian test to determine the tensile strength and these tests because since it was a stone it was uh, the tests were ca- carried at uh, nirm that is national institute of rock mechanics in kolar a part of a temple is considered as a model for testing and it is subjected to ground motions at cpri and the damping was found out of the material used for the construction of the temple using the material properties obtained from the laboratory and the plan obtained from the archaeological department of india and the damping which was obtained from the shake table test uh, a finite element model of a part of a temple is created using ansys software and is validated using natural frequency later the study is extended to design the whole temple to evaluate the model characteristics of the temple coming to the plan of the temple this is a main part of the temple and uh, here is the garbha gudi where the deity resides and here is it is a closed mantapa where the devotees uh, gather for to uh, offer prayers or worship god and this is an open mantapa where generally used for uh, 
cultural activities such as dancing or sometimes uh, they are used for meditation etc and on either side of the main temple here is a dining hall uh, and here is a shrine for the sharda devi and this temple is being recently built uh, it's not as old as the main temple with a, uh, the center line and column layout of the temple are drawn in autocad using the plan obtained from the archaeological uh, department and also by the reconnaissance survey uh, where we have crossed the dimensions uh, the total uh, uh, length from um, the total length from one end to the other end it is around 27.7 meters and uh, the width is uh, around 14.85 meters and the total height of the temple is 10.45 meters Uh, actually here is a here is a entrance for the temple and you can we can also enter here from here and uh, actually here uh, once they enter and here is the as i told it's a closed mantapa for worshiping the god here is the garbagudi and here is the exit for the temple and it is a uh, unsymmetrical uh, section and coming to the material testing various tests were carried out as i told you uh, Uh, to brief out two blocks of uh, soap stone of size 6 inches by 6 inches were collected from the nearby site of amriteshwara temple so that uh, the test can be carried out uh, later cylindrical core samples having diameter of 54 mm were poured from those blo uh, block samples and um, by using the rock core uh, drilling machines and were cut to the required length and uh, various as various tests were conducted un unidirectional compression test was carried out to determine compressive strength and the l by d was maintained uh, at 2 whereas for brazilian and brazilian test to for uh, to determine the tensile strength the l by d ratio was maintained as 0.5 for each test three samples were tested for de uh, determining the various parameters as presented here so an average value of these three samples was considered for the finite uh, um, element model So coming to the shake table test, initially we started our uh, work with a 3D printing of model using a PLA material that is polylactic acid. It is a, a type of uh, sort of a plastic, uh, and uh, the uh, same way the part of a temple uh, was 3D printed of a scale one is to 45 and one is to 25 respectively. The results obtained from the shake table test and analytical results were not validating. Generally, we focused on geometrical similitude and the mass. but uh, there are other things which are to be considered such as structural uh, uh, similitude wherein material properties uh, plays a very fundamental role in uh, similitude loss but uh, since it was our starting work uh, we started with that the, the 1 is to 45 scale was just because of the limitation in the 3d printing and uh, as we know that as scale goes on increases definitely the results will also reduces then the scale of the specimen used for the present study uh, shake table test was chosen as 1 is to 3 based on the uh, dimension of the shake table material used in the um, uh, since uh, material used in the prototype and model is the same as i told you um, material plays a metal property plays a very fundamental role so uh, later uh, uh, we used we started using uh, the same type of material for a prototype as well as model with the help of the test book harry and sabnis wherein the details of the scaling are explained we choose this uh, scale the uh, table 2 scaling factors wherein you can see the modulus e is 1 poisson's ratio is 1 if we, we use both the same material uh, in case of prototype as a model it is very important that the modulus eng's modulus is equivalent and also additional poisson's ratio must also be the same since we use the same material here it is one coming to the construction of the model according to the scaling each block along with the shear key was designed let me explain in this figure uh, for the shake table test we just only took the four columns and the four beams that are connected to this and the uh, dome which was placed on it only that was considered for the shake table test and as this column is in is not monolithic it consists of a uh, uh, various uh, cylindrical squares as i have mentioned here this uh, this is one this together it is one and from here it is the second part and this disc what we can see this is a third one and this rectangular plate with this disc is a fourth and this head is a fifth part and here it comes the beam the same way we designed you can see the numberings which we have given here the same way we assembled it and the, the, uh, they are all put together using a table but joint as in case of blocks what we see like this 
this was uh, during our uh, site visit so we, uh, we could see there was a column where the beam has been fallen down uh, long ago we just wanted to see how these are uh, connected then uh, these are connected with the table joints same way it is connected for all the uh, parts same way and the same way we uh, replicated it in our model as you can see the shear case here same way. okay the test was started with pg of 0.05g increased in steps of 0.25g up to a maximum of 0.1 the max we stopped at 0.1 because the maximum displacement at the top was seen as 20.67 mm so here you can see after the shake table test that uh, columns were rotated that means the torsion has taken place and the gaps between the beams are also widened here results here comes the results the natural frequency uh, obtained from the resonance test of the shake table is presented since we can see here we have observed, uh, we can observe the uh, dome and beam have same natural frequency whereas column has uh, different uh, natural frequencies this is because the whole uh, mantapa did not act as a single unit because they are just being placed on one over the other the column individual has got uh, uh, rotated and therein the frequencies change and for dome and beam together they were uh, uh, actually glued together and they hence acted as a single unit and uh, here comes the damping the logarithmic decrement method was used to determine the damping and uh, that is generally uh, dou is equal to natural log of xn divided by xn plus 1 which is equal to again 2 pi zeta divided by square root of 1 minus zeta square with that we found out the damping value as 6% by measuring the amplitudes and then coming to the numerical modeling of the scaled model here the, the model was uh, designed in uh, ansys 2016 software using solid 45 the same way the, all the components along with the shear case were designed and the connections were provided and the results obtained from the numerical model for the scaled temple here is the first five modes then comes uh, then uh, the comparison of the fundamental frequencies obtained through experimental and numerical uh, analysis here uh, we have matched so coming to the conclusions in the present study a scaled model uh, of amritesh temple with toysala architecture was designed constructed and commissioned shake table tests were conducted and scaled model uh, and the natural frequency were determined uh, at displacements and uh, damping were determined further a more a numerical model of the constructed scale model uh, and numerical analysis were performed again the uh, the results from numerical analysis and the laboratory measurements are in a good agreement does the scale structural model can replicate the behavior of behavior of the real temple in conclusion the scale temple model is a valid and qualified model that can be used for further experimental investigations the numerical results indicated in the vulnerability uh, of the structure mainly due to the lack of suitable interconnections between structural members so generally torsion was observed as a primary mode of uh, vibration uh, yeah. due to the plan irregularity of the temple and uh, as i told you earlier there was a gap between the beams and uh, there were uh, cracks visibly observed so these were the outputs and here are my references thank you thank you madam basanta lakshmi uh, thank you i didn't see anything in the q and a session uh, box so and also we are running out of time so thank you very yes. much for your presentation i now request thank my you. colleague uh, uh, snehal to conduct the proceedings remaining proceedings please yes yes now we have next one is uh, mr mk pradhan from homi baba national institute and baba atomic research and center mumbai uh, he will be presenting on uh, a study on shaking shaking table test and centrifuge test with a scale model in geotechnics so i welcome uh, mr pradhan for his presentation good afternoon uh, my study basically will be about the sec my topic will be the study on the sec table test and the centrifuge test with the scale model in geotechnics particular geotechnical engineering uh, basically the introduction will, will be whenever we design any structure yeah and like pile foundation or anything whenever we design it its accuracy is very important and to validate our accuracy after the numerical model or yeah, after the calculation with the reference of various theoretical models its very very validation is very much important so very type of test are performed to structural engineering and geotechnical engineering and for this we record the uh, model test and as per tc104 the physical modeling is definition is simplified physical representations of a finite boundary boundary problem for which similarity is sought in the context of the scaling laws so test but always the real always the testing of the real size uh, of prototype is not possible prototype means real which we generally use 
because the real size we cannot fabricate a real, real soil condition we cannot anticipate like a real size like uh, offshore structures dam tall building bridges which cannot can be fabricated so by the and another thing the real site condition like earthquake also cannot be anticipated and uh, by that time these structures cannot be uh, instrumented so most common methods particularly for the dynamic analysis for the validation of a numerical yeah, for the validation of any theoretical calculations we record basically two types of uh, experiments that is sectable as well as the centrifuge sectable is basically one g test and centrifuge is the increased enhanced g that can be 30 g 50 g and 100 g both are having its own advantage and uh, some limitations but whenever we approach for the sectable as well as centrifuge test approach in scaling laws and geometrical variations based on this its geometrical variation and material variation is very important and during our test we use various instruments to capture various results like uh, acceleration strain pore pressure and displacement from this observed this acceleration strain pore pressure and displacement we can derive our target various results like bending moment and this pressure all these things so so to perform the sectable test or centrifuge test its uh, fabrication or design of the uh, model is very much important model test for the sectable for the sectable and for centrifuge, this present one is sectable. We already have conducted one test, and in which generally it is called one G test. And when there is uh, because, but uh, sometimes what happens? Suppose twenty meter depth or fifty meter depth, the anticipated uh, soil pressure is not increased. Now, not, not not can be developed. In that case, we have to increase the G. Increase the so in that case we go for the centrifuge test. In a, my present case, we have developed one uh, this type of uh, we have developed a uh, model for the pile foundations for the diameter of one meter. We have we have designed a uh, scale model, reduced scale model of pile foundations of a very small size that is of seven fifty meter length and uh, that is of hollow tubes of twenty seven meter up meter. The design will I will present in subsequent case, but. Whenever we are going to, uh, just before presentation of Madam El, so he has presented the sectable test of the temple. Whenever we are going for the sectable test, yes, centrifuge test of any test, it, it's a uh, uh, design of uh, prototypes, uh, uh, the design of a model which resembles the prototype is very important. By the time it should uh, uh, perform the scale model, by the time full scale or real size prototypes and model, by that time there should be one link. There should be a very strong uh, relationship. That link is called similitude. Similarly, it provides the condition to design the scaled up or scaled down model or prototype to predict the structure response. Design of the model, design of the prototypes and the step of transferring the model test is very much important. This schematic presentation shows that first, to our target is like suppose PIDI or any structure that is prototype. We have to design the scale, reduced scale model, which is the model. We have to perform the test. After performing this test, various observations, we have to get the results and we have to make calculations and to and to, we can present what will be the results of the prototypes. But similar to this, there is various uh, there are various literatures in these areas uh, like Rocha and there is a various some of the important uh, literatures or uh, research work which are performed by various uh, researchers. But in these things, in this development of the model, we 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 have to follow some uh, basic physics and mathematics also. We have to uh, that should uh, one of that is the Bunkingham Pi theorem in which if there are m numbers of variables in our process and if there are, are the k numbers of fundamental dimension then we have to develop m minus n dimensional less constant these are the some of the basic whenever we are going to the design of the our models and one of the very typical application also presented very good papers by Vatacher 2011 in which they have developed the pile foundations and this dimensional these are the some of the dimensional uh, dimensional parameters this relation is very much important to predict, to predict the uh, observe, uh, to predict the results of the prototype from the model. In this case, like they have from the soil uh, field soil test, they have calculated the various uh, parameters from the model test to prototypes. Considering the load, this equation equation two is, and similarly, considering the bending strain, equation three. Because I am presenting these relations because these are the some classical examples from which with. The uh, results from the proto model, we can derive the prototype as well as from the pro prototype, we can design the model. But whenever we are talking about the uh, prototype and the model, there should be some similarity. There should be geometrical similarity like length, area, and volumetric. Kinematic, that is, should be time and kinematic, kinematic scale. And there should be, there, there also should be dynamic similarity. But it is, I want to mention that all the scaling similarity is uh, next to impossible and some, sometimes not feasible. This is one typical case. 
suppose if you are having the prototype of like this top weight and this cylinder support if you are make, making the model by the time if you will calculate the stress stress in this support and stress in the support there are not matching it is 2 2500 and in this case 250 so that means it is the, there is a difference in stress although we have uh, developed the design of the prototype why there is changing there is changing due to the following uh, there is due to the uh, changing in the set but how this model can be uh, matched by increasing the density of the uh, model or increasing the gravity or adding the mass this increasing the gravity is the basic fundamental to for which we implemented this centrifuge because increasing the gra gravity we develop the stress which can we can apply the 20 meter depth or 50 meter depth and sometimes we are forced to uh, design the model of different material suppose i am doing the pile foundation of concrete but a pile foundation of 1 meter diameter is not possible but whenever we are we have we can opt for another material so there are various papers various research are have done uh, for the replacing the pile material with hollow pipe in our study also we have changed our material uh, as the aluminum hollow sections with the application of this relationship ei stiffness of the prototype to the model lambda to the 5 lambda is the scaling ratio a uh, sectable test uh, purpose of the second table is to validate we have done the sectable test and advantage of sectable is it is well controlled uh, large magnitude as well as the multi axle input and easier experimental measurement this is the typical case of the suppose one type of the prototype and this prototype we can go for the model in this case the total structure is embedded in the, uh, the pile foundation is embedded in the sectable so this is called a small schematic presentation of how a prototype and how model can be uh, tested and the various other for the sectable table test we require the sectable platform actuator box container instrument and shield in my case we have developed a, we have performed the sectable test we have used this tech this is the actuator this is system room and this pile foundation we have first uh, design dr das we have tech we have uh, fabricated the uh, actual uh, model of pile foundation which of the 27 mm outer diameter and 750 mm length which resembles the 15 meter depth pile of 1 meter diameter prototype and we have applied the dynam and the actuator through the actuator we can apply the different different type dynamic load that came in with dynamic motion that may be pure sinusoid or that can be actual earthquake if time history is available but in particular sectable is it is very very important part is the box container design because this box container because whenever we are design because our pile foundation that should be embedded in a container because we are not going to the infinite boundary but by the time whenever we are placing the model in the box box container there is the reflection from the uh, uh, boundary is must to minimizing the boundary effects there are various uh, developed uh, bound uh, tanks as a, uh, like this rigid tank but that should be sufficiently large to minimize the uh, uh, boundary reflections that rigid tank packed with the flexible material like foam at the side or that may be laminated soil tank or that can be of soil tank with the wall having hinge based or flexible container these are the various uh, techniques various uh, methods followed for the designing to minimize the boundary reflections this is in our case we have placed the geofoam soft material like this to minimize the boundary reflections these are various uh, methods of uh, pile uh, soil sample preparation these are the basic some are methods are available in various literature subject to the centrifuge test as already i mentioned in sectable test there is one limitation suppose we are uh, we are doing one test of 50 meter depth soil at the depth of 50 meter depth what will be the pressure that can be generated in sectable to uh, but that type of limitation can be uh, targeted can be achieved using the centrifuge test by increase the gravitational force we can increase the stress uh stress at 50 meter depth pradhan your yes, time sir. is up you have to uh, rush a little okay? yes sir yes sir but centrifuge test is it is a very, very most important uh, application is slow, slow stability as well the retaining wall as a tunnel stability or lateral pressure as i already have mentioned and what that a centrifuge test we have to keep this some of the important parameters uh, like uh, uh, this uh, to validate this 11, 11 number equations we have to uh, to match the gravitational we have to to match the depth requirement we have to increase the gravitational similar way in slope stability that uh, application of the centrifuge stability that uh, stability number that is nsl so by that time it's a cu by h so we have to match we can uh, that is a very good application of centrifuges in my case there are some of the instruments like strain gauge accelerometer velocity pressure measure they are uh, used and these are the methods how to perform the test but after the test we, we after obtaining the 
strain we can calculate the moment and we can calculate the pressure force as well as the displacement in our in my case we have de uh, developed the uh, model pile and we have performed the safe table and uh, numerical validate with this and we have calculated and uh, validate with the uh, theoretical calculations uh, in my case also in cell we have checked what can be provided materials for the model pile we have checked for aluminum steel plastic and micro piles and after that we found that these are the what will be the diameter and scaling factor in our case also it was a 20 meter these are the parameters we have studied in cell what what type of material we will uh, take and what will be the approximate diameter to, uh, with the uh, scaling factors we in our case we go for the aluminum hollow section with one thickness of uh, particularly in our case that was about 1.2 mm it was our target material was uh, prototype was concrete how is our model was aluminum section was solid how our, our model was hollow circular and the diameter in uh, prototype that was approximately 100 mm in our case 27 od and one to the thick well thickness and these are the calculation which we have derived and these are the our test uh, setup in which we performed our test and after that it is very important because after the test what are the results we obtained we have to make calculation what will be the various uh, results will be uh, in prototypes uh, it is not that much uh, straight forward it is very tricky as i already i mentioned we have to develop some uh, dimensional less constant from that we can perform however there is one very good paper available the moir good who has provided some guidance how the, uh, the link between laboratory test and centrifuge test with the, this uh, relationship we can uh, calculate and establish uh, after this we can say that the conclusion that this uh, always it is very much required we have give that much importance to the experimental test not only numerical validate, numerical test is uh, numerical model is always important because we have to validate the numerical model or theoretical calculation we must go for the uh, experimental test like uh, sector or simple pen and it is also simple and cost saving and time saving it can be used for any analytical model limitation is not sometimes feasible and so and the sectable test and sensitive test are universally accepted but however there may be some limitations on uh, unknown parameters cannot be entered and there may be a limitation of the available facility sometimes however design of scale model required attention and utmost care which we not should not miss and that proper relation should be there uh, with uh, this uh, i we referred some various uh, reference papers which are uh, what they mentioned here thank you sir. yeah i thank mr pradhan for his excellent lecture Uh, if anybody is having any question, they can send it to question and answer queries. I think, uh, right, sir? Uh, since we have a less time, right? Yeah, yeah. And still, two more presentations are there. So, thank you very much, Dr. Pradham. Now, yeah. I thank you, madam. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Now, I invite uh, Mr. Jaya Ra Jaya Rajan P from National Institute of Technology, Calicut. Uh, to deliver his talk on a critical review of indian seismic codes for buildings in the light of international codes of practice so okay, yeah mr jayar uh, is already a good afternoon i think a very good afternoon to all so myself jayarajan as a faculty with nit calicut so the title of my manuscript is a critical review of indian seismic codes for buildings in the light of international codes of practice i just want to tell you a very important thing that uh, many of this review has been taken based on my uh, earlier experience 20 years of experience with uh, critical projects like the petrochemical projects refineries and power plants etc so let me just uh, take you through so the various review process documents that the indian standards used for the review includes is 1893 part 1 2016 and is 13920201016 is 800 2007 now the problem is that as we are aware we don't have a very specific uh, document available for the seismic design and detailing of steel structures so currently we have only section 12 of is 800 2007 for and for the benchmarking and for the review purpose various international codes are used i don't have i don't want to read out all the titles i will uh, tell you the only the uh, names ac 716 then euro code 8 then ac 4117 then ac 318 and ac 341 that is for uh, the structural steel buildings now what exactly is the relevance of this review so the relevance includes the, as we all know the progress made in the field of earthquake engineering and mitigation in india when compared to the developed world has been quite inadequate we know that many experiences or many developments are being taking place or very prestigious research institutes but uh, such things have now been translated into a codal document the second thing is that the indian seismic code is 1893 part 
it still needs to adapt to the modern state of the art design and construction practices to ensure safety against seismic hazards. The court lacks in its present form many important provisions required for earthquake resistant design and detailing. Regarding the objectives of this critical review is to highlight the limitations and omissions in the latest Indian seismic codes to highlight the potential areas which requires immediate remedial action, then to suggest the important updates and revisions required to make the current practice in the detailed engineering of earthquake resistant structures at par with the other international codes. Now, the review procedure is split into four stages, one covering the general provisions, the second one only for the building structures, and the third and fourth covering the RCC and the steel structures. And, uh, and it is a review process ends with a, a conclusion. I know that it is a very detailed procedure, but I will be just touching on only on the main aspects. Now, let me just take you to the review process considering only the general provisions. One is the seismic hazard maps. The seismic, uh, presently we have the seismic zonation maps, but all these zonation maps are not prepared based on the PSHA, that's a probability. So the lacuna associated with this will be the definition of the ground motion with the different probabilities of accidents are not possible. Now coming to the local ground conditions that is taken up with the Indian seismic codes, currently we have only three soil types. That's a type one, type two, and type three, corresponding to the hard, medium, and the loose soils. And therefore, all this needs to be reworked so that we have an adequate representation of the soil profiles all across the country. So this is very limited, three soil types only. Now to capture the sensitivity of the soil deposits to the amplification of the ground motions, VS30, that is the velocity of the second S waves in the top 30 meter shall be used as a basis in place of the currently followed SPT and values. And I would like to bring you to notice that currently the EC8 uses seven ground types. We have only three types and the ACC7 provide six site classes. Then another very important thing I want to tell you is the spectra versus the earthquake. As we all know from our basic understanding of the earthquake response, in addition to the site-specific soil properties, the amplification at a particular soil site is also governed by the magnitude of the earthquake, and thereby it will affect the spectra. And such a magnitude-specific spectra definition, it is absent in IS-1893. So in this context, I would like to show you the two types of spectra that is available in EC8, type 1 spectra and type 2 spectra. Type 1 spectra is for a surface magnitude greater than or equal to 5.5, whereas type 2 is for magnitude less than 5.5. Whereas, as you are aware, currently the spectra given in IS-1893 is only considering the three soil profile types. And further, I would like to highlight one important thing, that's the amplification in the short period range that is this son that is neglected. Now the response reduction factor. The response reduction factor is, uh, you know, is a, one of the very important factor, which we should find its implication. And we should also know how to convert this response spectra factor to a proper detail, detailing and construction into the site. Because our factor in the design documents should be effectively transferred to the construction through the ductile detailing. That's a very important thing. Now, the value of R to be used in the spectra for a given structural system, it should be period dependent. This is very important. R value should be period dependent in the spectra. Because we know that EC8, it uses lower R values at short periods. In IS-1893, we do not have a R value specific to the period. R value is uniformly applied all across all time periods. Now, coming to the partial safety factor, this is one very important thing I want to highlight. Because in the, if you open the IS 1893, we'll find that larger partial safety factors 1.2 and 1.5 are attached with the seismic actions. What does this mean? It does mean that the corresponding seismic demand will get times very large and our designs are likely to be uneconomical. And I would like to tell you that EC8 and AC7 uses a much lower safety factor of just one for the computation of seismic actions. So if we correct our seismic factors, partial safety factors here, we are going to end up with a much economical design. So this is a very critical area where one should have a look. Now, let me go take you to the building structures. Now, regarding the limited option available for the structural engineers. Now, in IS-1893 part one, uh, as far as the sources three, four, and five are concerned, we have got only two options. 
either only one option that is either we have to go for the special mount resistance frames that is SMRF or ductile RC walls. So we have got only two limit two options either go for SMRF or uh, ductile RCC walls. The designer do have do not have any kind of an alternative. Whereas if you go to the AC8, the designers have been provided the option of uh, either go for a medium or go for a high ductility structure. AC8 also permits a use of a higher value of R. This is a very important thing which I have already implemented in my design also. If, a substanti if it is substantiated in a pushover analysis, that means if our uh, pushover analysis indicates that, yes, we can go ahead a value of R, which is much higher than the, that given in the IS-1893, yes, you can go ahead. But IS-1893 do not have any kind of a provision for that. Further, 1893 do not take care of any kind of a reduction in R considering the structural irregularities. Now, further, many for many structural systems, R values are not available. For example, the coupled walls, we do not have the R values, torsionally flexible systems, we don't have, and other inverter pendulum structures also we do not have. Now, regarding the approximate periods and the base shear distribution, now I just want to tell you one very important thing. It is a clear intent of any code writer to provide, you know, a period. That is a fundamental time period, so that you will end up with a larger seismic demand. So, but unfortunately, in IS 1893, uh, the computation of approximate period for structural systems like eccentrically braced frame systems and buckling restrained braced frame systems are missing. And further, you will find that the IS code asks you to take assume a parabolic distribution of the base shear. This will land up in a very large seismic demand. And I just want to tell you that EC8 asks you to take you through a linear distribution of the base shear. So here it is linear, here it is parabolic. So you can understand the difference. And further, in AC7, we have got a period specific distribution. Now, another very important thing uh, that uh, the designers and counter is a second order effects. That is the effect of the deformations caused by the seismicity on the gravity loads. IS1893 do not have any provisions for taking the second order effects in the seismic demand calculations. Whereas if you see the AC7 and AC8, they make use of the stability that takes care of all the second order effects into the seismic demand calculations. Now, the limit on the computer based shear. So the code says that whether you are using a response spectrum analysis or a time history analysis, your uh, base shear should not go uh, below a minimum one. Actually, this requirement obviously do not have any basis and eliminates the advantage that you derive out from the exact analysis. Now, one very important thing which IS 1893 is missing is it do not provide us any procedure for the selection of the ground motion records. So now we know that as far as the, the, the seismic engineering is concerned, the performance based earthquake engineering is gaining acceptance all around the globe. And the selection of the ground motion records is one of the basic steps involved in this. So it is important that we need to include all such procedures for the selection of the ground motion records. And here, I want to tell you that both AC7 and AC8 permit the use of nonlinear static, which is properly known as the pushover analysis, and the nonlinear response history analysis known as NLRHA. Uh, and it also gives us, make use of high, the, non, the high static models from IAC 4117 here Excuse for your- me, sir, your time is up, okay? You have to- Yes, um, yes, yes, fast, madam, yeah. I, will be, I will be going fast. So this is a, uh, you know, the force deformation curves shown here. Now, the performance limits, regarding the performance limits, the main problem I want to highlight is that uh, we need to use a different limit state. For example, we need to, we cannot use the same earthquake that is used for the descent strength verification for the story drift calculation. We need to use a different kind of a, that is, a, that is known as the damage limitation requirement. We don't have an earthquake scenario in our code like that. And <clears throat> the IS-1893 currently misses any design criteria for the non-structural elements, which are very important. We know that in many earthquake hazards, damages, non-structural elements are very critical. And presently, IS-1893 also do not provide us any DSSA effects. So displacement-based approach is not uh, provided in the IS-1893. And then I want to quickly take you through the RCC structures. And uh, 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 analysis of this IS-1893 provision says that many of the provisions have been taken from ACA-318. But uh, some of the critical provisions in ACA 318 are being missed. Okay. Now, the missing structural elements, we don't have any kind of uh, a criteria for uh, the for many structural actions. The code do not cover any 
criteria, provide any criteria for the flat slab structures and also prefabricated structures, we don't have any criteria. And regarding the beam detailing, I want to just say that the critical aspects, things I want to tell you is the spacing of the links. In the critical sounds, they have provided a critical spacing of 100 mm, which is likely to congest the construction purpose, whereas in AC318, we have got only say 150 mm. And the Indian code again uses 1.4 times the beam moments for the competition of the shears, which is very much higher. And regarding the column detailing, here again, one very important thing I want to tell you is that we know that the strong column big beam philosophy is very important, wherein we use a 1.4 times the sum of the design strength of the beams. This 1.4 factor seems to be very much higher compared to the easier recommendations. And there are many other requirements which I don't want to cover right now. And the beam column joint, okay, there are many other uh, philosophies. And here I want to tell you is that here regarding the, you know, the strength of the joint, uh, they have used a stress level of 1.25 f in the beam longitudinal bars okay and now the structural bars there are many provisions given in the uh, the is 1893 which need to be updated and you can go through this presentation okay one of the very important thing is that it do not provide much detailed guidelines regarding the boundary elements okay and then the steel structures steel structures i will take madam just one more minute the steel structures is another critical area. Currently, we don't have a separate document like IS 39920. We've got only section 12 of IS 800 2007. And uh, there are many things added. This is a very important requirement for the updation of the uh, th things. And then, and here I want to tell you that just like is in the critical, critical uh, you know, the factors 1.2 and 1.5, this has to be drastically reduced to 1.0. Then only we can arrive at a seismic design. Then. And the very important thing is that it provides a load factor of 2.5. IS 800 provides a load factor of 2.5 for the seismic design. This do not have any basis and will land up in very uneconomical designs. And then the R values, we don't have R values for many, many uh, systems, like for example, concentrically braced for the weave shaped bracings. It asks for a specialist literature. Okay. So there are many missing things in the structural designs. So to come to the conclusions, I want to highlight very important things that the recently revised Indian seismic codes for buildings are plagued by conservatism, empirical approach, and omission of much needed procedures and guidelines. The Indian seismic codes need to embrace the latest developments in earthquake engineering and detailing. While the detail, ductile detailing of RCC is with enough scope for further improvement, earthquake detailing of uh, steel structures is still an area of great concern. It is expected that a separate code dedicated seismic design and detailing of structural steel buildings will be developed in near future, and it will be in alignment with the international codes. Seismic, seismic design requirements for structures with the seismic isolation and dynamic systems are yet to be developed. The existing codes also do not cover many of the structural systems being formulated and widely used in seismic regions of the developed world in the last three decades. That's all, madam. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you, um, Jaya Ramanji, and uh, for your excellent lecture and the comparison on the uh, quotes, seismic quotes. Okay, I thank you uh, for this presentation. Now, I like to invite uh, Mr. Paplu Chaudhary from National Institute of Technology, Karnataka, uh, for his lecture on uh, Tsunami Resilient Foundation for Breakwater Centrifuge Model Test. So if anybody is having any question regarding the previous presentation, you can just uh, add in the question and answer section. Okay. That will be answered later. Yeah. Good afternoon, uh, madam. Thank you very much. Uh, very, a very good afternoon to the chair, co-chair, and uh, all the dignity present here. I'm very much thankful to the organizer for giving me opportunity to share our study. Myself, Bablu Chaudhary, I'm a faculty in uh, Department of Civil Engineering. NITK Suratkal. The, today I'm going to discuss the topic Tsunami Resilient Foundation for Breakwater uh, a Centrifuge Model Test. Uh, these are the contents. Uh, I start with introduction, then I will uh, go to the Centrifuge Model Test, result in discussion, finally conclusion. So uh, maybe uh, most of you might have aware, uh, but uh, it's a courtesy I have to introduce. Breakwater, what is a breakwater? It is an offshore structure which is constructed to protect the port and harbor from sea wave, current, typhoon, and even from tsunami. So this is a breakwater. We can see this uh, harbor side, the uh, sea, uh, sea water is cool and calm. However, the seaside, there are lots of disturbance. So basically, for construction of the breakwater, large number of boulders and rubbles will dump on the seabed, 
and uh, a numbers of cation are provided on the, on the surface of this rubble mound and it's behave like a wall so this is a breakwater going to the what are the past studies uh, in past what happened uh, giving one example the 2011 great is japan earthquake tsunami this is the earthquake intensity map it was the most powerful earthquake ever hit japan in the recorded history so this is the most affected area due to this very powerful tsunami wave up to 40 meter height uh, strike the pacific coast of the tsunami here these are the red color are the most critical area where the height of tsunami was more if you see the map these are the most affected area of the japan and these are the major port located in the most affected area so uh, tsunami uh, after that the survey were conducted and it was found that the the breakwater at all almost all the port were damaged heavily this is the name of the port breakwater length damage length and this is the percentage if you see almost all the break uh, breakwater presented at this port were severely damaged after that uh, detailed this uh, investigation were carried out and uh, many report came and all of them having same conclusion i am mentioning here kajame noda uh, they have conducted concluded that this breakwater was failed mainly due to the failure occurred due to either sliding of the cation or storing of the mound so it was nothing but the foundation failure so the ball was in the court of geotechnical people because this breakwater don't have significant structural damage there is this breakwater were damaged mainly due to the failure of their foundation or maybe geotechnical reason so geotechnical people has to come forward to give the solution so this is a part of that one so i am giving one example through that i will it will be a, i will try to make clear how it happened how, how the collapse happened of this breakwater breakwater is kamaishi port japan it is the world deepest breakwater depth was 63 meter located at the kamaishi port here this is the breakwater this breakwater and this between before the earthquake tsunami and after the earthquake tsunami you we can see that this breakwater was washed away if you see the satellite pictures the cason were slid from the mound and sank into the sea most of the cason and that become the reason of failure of the breakwater so port and harbor a uh, port and airport research institute we called par in japan uh, they one researcher they came forward with this uh, animation to show what what are the main reason of failure of the kamaishi breakwater uh, the main reason were large water level difference between the front and back of the breakwater it was 8.2 meter at that time huge horizontal force loaded on the cation due to tsunami mound scoring due to overflowing tsunami water and a strong joint failure in addition in our study also we found that seepage was another big reason uh, of the failure the breakwater so the key issue was we have to develop the reinforcing countermeasure for the breakwater foundation to make the breakwater resilient against earthquake and tsunami in this damage here it should be noted that i have mentioned here not only tsunami but earthquake also generally tsunami preceded uh, earthquake and the earth tsunami generating earthquake have very strong amplitude and uh, very strong earthquake that has a significant effect so if we generate any countermeasure for only tsunami it may not be successful because a very strong earthquake is coming before the tsunami and that countermeasure is if it is developed only for tsunami during earthquake it may damage itself so it is very important see those countermeasure should be effective against earthquake as well as the tsunami in addition the lots of coastal structure in fact the breakwater is a very huge structure like dam in fact bigger than dam because length is coming sometime kilometer so the countermeasure should not be developed only for the new construction but for the existing structures also so this is a part of in this pipeline so i am going to show by this uh, slide what happening during the earthquake and tsunami is striking your breakwater so during earthquake excess for water pressure may generate in the foundation soil or can see seabed soil specific inertia force will act 
on the breakwater. Finally, the your seabed may deform and the breakwater may settle, and horizontal displacement is also expected. During tsunami, tsunami force will act on the breakwater. Escorting may occur on the harbor side, the, and seepage is of course very uh, expected through the foundation. And due to the high seepage piping of the seabed may occur. So finally, we get the high deformation and high scoring of this breakwater. So to mitigate such type of damage of a breakwater, it is a composite type breakwater, it is a standard breakwater having seabed and the question is here and ruble mound. So we have developed a new technique in order to mitigate such type of damage of a breakwater. We provide two rows of seed pile at the edges of this ruble mound and uh, cover the whole mound by a number of gabions. The main purpose of this seed pile where during the earthquake, lateral flow of the foundation ground might be one of the reasons of the damage of the breakwater. So these seed pile can assist or uh, give reduce such type of deformation of ground and hence settlement can be reduced. At the same time, during tsunami, the seed pile behave as a cut off wall and it can, can reduce the seepage from the seabed. So, and this main purpose of gabion where it can reduce the scoring of the caused by the overflowing tsunami because this gabion were made of the rubble and encased in the metal net. So, this is typically heavier than the ruble and so it is not easily to escort by the tsunami wave. So this is a standard uh, unreinforced breakwater we are saying right now and this is the reinforced breakwater we have developed with a gab with gabions and two rows of seed pile. For this uh, study the breakwater at Miyazaki port Japan is chosen as a prototype model and prototype model ratio was 225 because we are going to go uh, conduct the centrifuge model test. So why centrifuge model test is uh, very important for especially for the geotechnical engineering. Uh, I'm not going to uh, bring you deep. It is a well-known fact, but uh, just brief explanation because the sand is behavior of sand is highly non-linear. Non Whenever it is prototype and uh, but we conduct the uh, experiment is a scale, a small scale. So their stress level is very less in the model, like almost negligible. But in the field, the uh, structure below the ground is very under high stress and this is not linear behavior. Sand do not, uh, sorry, do not have the linear behavior. So a small scale test conducted under 1G gravitational field, whatever we are called the 1G second table test and other dynamic tests or in fact uh, aesthetic test also could not be extrapolated to a prototype scale properly. So for that problem, we have the centrifuge model test. In this centrifuge model test, we can develop a correct prototype level stretch and strain so that the behavior of sand will be same as of whatever in the this one. So in this is the centrifuge. In one side, we have fixed our model. In another side, the equal balance is giving that and it rotates with very high speed. And here the centrifuge acceleration is generated, which giving the centrifuge fuel force here. Uh, excuse me, ma'am. Uh, I'm only remaining 20 seconds. Yes, okay. yes, you, you have 16 seconds now. Timing is correct or some? Yes, yes, timing is correct. So we are conducted in uh, this in Kyoto University. So uh, after that, it's running in very, very high you, you speed. You have to rush a little, okay? Yeah, 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 yes. And, and after that, we have uh, closed this, and everything is monitored by a remote cabin. But this is a, a special type of tank we have developed for, especially for centrifuge uh, tsunami overflow test in centrifuge uh, model test. Uh, very limited uh, lab in the world has the facility to conduct tsunami overflow tests in the centrifuge model test. For that, a special uh, arrangement we have made. Here we have provided the gate, it is a water tank. After uh, giving the Wi-Fi signal, remote signal, it open and the water is striking here. And the striking of the breakwater, it is collected here. So this is our uh, experimental setup. By giving signal, it is open. Then water is striking here. After that, water collecting. Here, in this study, we have uh, measured the vertical settlement origin the displacement of the cation, pore water pressure and acceleration as well as the pore water pressure on the cation also. So generally, uh, 
tsunami generating earthquake have so many four shocks and main shock here we have considered two four shock and main shock which are in prototype it was magnitude 0.1g 2g and 4g as corresponding for the model we have given so we here i am saying showing you the average settlement of the cation for the four shock and main shock uh, with increase of acceleration amplitude every settlement increases same is happening for horizontal displacement also here is the comparison between the what we have generated reinforced breakwater and unreinforced breakwater this is for settlement of the cation this is for horizontal displacement of the cation here we can see that by using this technique we can reduce the settlement and horizontal displacement more than 50% the reason i have already discussed in, uh, in the mechanism so this is the photograph after the earthquake loading we have conducted the uh, numerical simulation also we can see there are lots of deformation below this one but the this seed pile was found very effective to reduce such type of damage in this case here the deformation is high here the deformation is low the tsunami overflow test uh on reinforced breakwater was complete collapsed completely however reinforced breakwater was resilient this is for settlement settlement this is for average horizontal displacement so this is a uh, we have conducted a large number of uh, Test 1G model test also, second table test and centrifuge model test also. This is especially for tamaisi breakwater. This is the deepest breakwater as I have mentioned, 63 meter depth. Before that, whatever I have discussed, that is Miyazaki port breakwater. This is a standard breakwater, 22 meter height. So here, it, sorry, conclusion is uh, for practical solution against tsunami, anti earthquake measures should be also taken into account. Lateral flow was the main reason of uh, failure of the foundation during earthquake. And seed pile gave in were found effective during tsunami force, tsunami impact force, scouring and seepage were the main reason of the failures. However, the proposed reinforcing countermeasure was found effective. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Chaudhary, for your uh, nice lecture. Okay, so I think we have done with uh, all the presentations now, uh, sir. So, if yeah. anybody is having any question regarding this uh, one last two lectures, so they can ask for within one or two minutes, right? Yeah. We also we don't have any question in the question and answer queries. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we if there is no questions. We can conclude now. Yes, madam. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, we had a very interesting session. Even though we short the time by nearly close to 20 minutes, we took more time for the session. There were very interesting talks, all of them presented very well. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers of the conference for giving me this opportunity to participate in this conference. And I would leave the floor to my colleagues, Nehal, if she has any comments to make. And then we yeah. can take the session. Yeah, this was a very good uh, session. Actually, this was actually first time for me to co-chair any conference uh, like this international conference. So quite a, a good experience here. And I thank you to the organizers uh, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Govind Raju and uh, Dr. Rao uh, for your kind support here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Goindraj, I declare the session as closed. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, you have managed the show very well and uh, very aptly you concluded about uh, the special lecture delivered by Sirish as well as the presentation series by various authors uh, with strict control over their timing. So it all goes by your uh, rich experiences. Uh, due to constraint of the time, I will not take much uh, of your time and we have to move on to the next session. So on behalf of the organizing committee and then on my behalf, I thank profoundly to our chair, Dr. K. Sanjinder Rao for sparing his variable time and associating with us to, and at the same time accepting our invitation. So, so very kind of you, sir for uh, making this uh, event uh, uh, successful. So once again, I thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I take this opportunity to thank our co-chair, Dr. Snehal Kausik, who is very dynamic. And uh, we would like to see you in many more uh, events uh, in the coming days. Thank sure, you sure, once sir. again. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, last, but, uh, last but not least, uh, I uh, wish to thank my friend 
professor shiri sarade for delivering excellent lecture uh, as a opening uh, batsman in this one so we would like to see dr sirish uh, with uh, much more interactions much. in coming uh, days thank you thank you thank you very much thank you so we shall close the session sir thank you very much sir thank have you. a nice day yeah thank you thank you all thank you all thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.